So I decided I would go into science as a way of finding truth in this world. So I dedicated my life to that science quest and ended up going in deeper in biology. And I was programmed with the conventional beliefs of biology that a human body was essentially a biochemical machine controlled by genes. That we were just here for the moment of our existence and that, as Rupert mentioned, once the body died, it was all gone again. So I was teaching this ultimately to students in medical school. I was teaching the belief that all we are are just readouts of genes. And the significance of that was that I was teaching what was called the central dogma. And this is the actual name of the concept in science. The central dogma, which was offered by Francis Crick, and that's a Francis Crick and Jim Watson who founded DNA. The central dogma just simply stated that our lives are derived from DNA. That the information in biology goes from DNA to an intermediate molecule called RNA and ultimately to protein. And the protein molecules are very important because the protein molecules are what make up your body. The physical structure of your body and the behavior of your life are all due to the proteins. But if the proteins then come from the DNA, that would suggest that we are programmed in our lives by our DNA. So I was teaching the central dogma, and there's a very profound significance to that concept for the average person in this world, and it's based on this. As far as we know, we didn't pick the genes that we were born with, and since the genes control our lives, and we didn't pick them, and we can't change them, then more or less we become victims of our heredity that our lives are just victims trying to look at forces outside of our control, which was the DNA and the genes. When you have a concept of being a victim, you also then need uh, what you might call a rescuer, someone to help you not be a victim. So all of a sudden, when you own that you're a victim, you buy into some other source that will help you overcome your victimhood, which would be medicine. So I had the opportunity of cloning stem cells in tissue culture in 1967, so that was 40 years ago. And the beautiful part about cloning a stem cell is simply this. I had the opportunity to identify a single stem cell and isolate one stem cell and put it in a petri dish. And the cell would divide into two cells and then four cells and eight, and pretty soon there would be thousands of cells in the petri dish. But what is unique? All of the cells came from the same parent, so all of the cells are genetically identical. I then, in my early experiments, split up a culture into three parts. Into three different dishes, I split the cells. And in one dish, I put a culture medium with slightly different media content than in the second dish. And that was a different culture medium. And then I changed the culture medium even a little bit in the third dish. And when the cells grew up, in one dish they form muscle, in one dish they form bone, in one dish they form fat cells. And all of a sudden my, my world was shaken because I realized the cells were genetically identical. So what was it that controlled the fate of the cell? It wasn't the genes because they all had the same genes. What I recognized was the environment was shaping the development of the cells. So the significance of this was that while I was teaching the central dogma that genes control life, my research revealed a completely different story. I published my research, and yet my colleagues were very upset with me because they called me a heretic. And I found this kind of confusing to be in science and to be called a heretic. But then it wasn't really confusing when I looked up the definition of the word dogma, which I never looked up. And I've been teaching it now for 10 years, and I finally looked up the word, and the word dogma is a belief based on religious persuasion and not scientific fact. And then all of a sudden I realized that science had become religion at this point, and indeed I was a heretic. So ultimately I found that there was too much conflict in my community at University of Wisconsin, 
I resigned my tenured position and left the university because there was no support for the radical ideas that I was seeing in the tissue cultures 30 or more years ago. I ultimately had an opportunity to end up at Stanford University. It was a very interesting job interview because when I was giving my presentation in the audience were all the genetic leaders essentially of the world at that time. I looked around and there was a chairman of the biology department, the chairman of genetics, the chairman of pathology, and all these people were working on genes. And I was trying to describe that perhaps genes were not that important. And it's funny because sometimes the words come from the sky and then just come into my head and I say the words. And so uh, I was making a conclusion and I heard these words in my head. I thought they were funny. And I just said them to the audience. I said, if you think DNA is the end of all of everything, well, you're no better than a fundamentalist. Well, that caused a very big uproar in the audience. They all started yelling at me, and I was in a job interview, and my mind started to look at people yelling and screaming at me, all these genetic people. And, uh, my breath was taken away, and I hear a little quiet voice in my head saying, this job interview isn't going well. <laughs> And at some point, I was sinking lower and lower because they just kept yelling. And then when I sunk low enough, my belt caught on the chalk tray in the front of the room, and I said, that's as low as I'm going to go. And I started to yell back at the other geneticists. And the first thing I yelled back was, there was life on this planet before there was DNA, so you can't say that that is the source of life. And the important question I was trying to find out is, how does the environmental information cross into the cell? Where is the equivalent of a brain in a cell? What is it that interprets the world for the cell and adjusts the biology? Well, the convention at the time, of course, is that the brain of the cell was the nucleus of the cell because that's where the genes were. But I already knew that this was a false statement because in my training as an embryologist and in my own research, I know that you could take a nucleus with all the genes out of the cell and throw it away, and that the cell does not die, that the cell can live for two or more months with no genes in it, and it changes its life as it moves through its own world. It reacts to toxins in a different way, it responds to other cells. It still has its life, it's eating and breathing and carrying out all life functions with no genes. So the first thing that has to come to is that the genes are not controlling the life of the cell. And then I started to go back in history and say, well, where would be the source of the control? And it turns out it was the skin of the cell, the cell membrane. And it's very interesting because the skin of the human is the equivalent of the skin of the cell. And that our human brain is actually derived from our skin. And so I started to recognize that the membrane of the cell was the brain of the cell. And one night in 1985, after 10 years of trying to understand the nature of the mechanism of how the membrane was the brain, I wrote down a definition of the cell membrane in a different way than I'd ever done. This is the de exact definition that I wrote. The cell membrane is a liquid crystal semiconductor with gates and channels. When I wrote that down, I said, that sounds very familiar. But I didn't know where I heard it before. But I had my first computer. And in a book from a, a, a simple book on understanding your microprocessor. And in the first two pages of the book, there's a definition of a computer chip. And a computer chip is a crystal semiconductor with gates and channels. And then in a moment I said, isn't it coincidence? They have the same definition. But the deeper I looked, the more I found that it wasn't a coincidence. They are structural equivalents. The cell membrane is a carbon-based chip. It's an information processor. And as a result of understanding the nature of that, I started to recognize that the nucleus was a hard drive, a disk with software programs. And the software were the genes. And what was very interesting was, we've always held the belief that the genes were permanent hard structures. But then I started to recognize that the gene chain readout would change based on the environment. And as a result, I started to recognize that the environment was controlling the reading of the genes. And in fact, I started to recognize that a gene could get many different, the same gene, 
could get many different readings based on the environment. 